Okay, folks, I think I'm live. And I think once again, the phone has decided that we are going to go sideways. So let's just check. <laughs> uh, just waiting for the stream to come on the other, other side. Oh, it's nearly the end of the year, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Uh, that's so weird. I don't know what I should do. Should I go this way? Oh, hold on. If I go this way. Okay, yeah, there we go. Perfect. All right, you can all see me again. Uh, <laughs> all right, folks. Uh, just checking the sound once again. Yeah, good. All right, let's get rid of these so that I don't have to uh, be looking at those. So I can see everybody. Uh, welcome to the last live of the year. Um, so if you haven't seen me before, if this is your first time joining one of the streams, then my name is Dr. Clara Nellist and I am a particle physicist working on the Atlas experiment at CERN and I am based at the University of Amsterdam and with NICEF here in the Netherlands. Um, so that's where I am right now. I'm going to tilt this down a little bit so you can all see me better. Um, Okay, excellent. So it's not the last live ever. I just saw a comment. It's the last live of the year. Also, if you see the screen shake quite a lot, then uh, it's because my tripod is broken because it is the end of the year and we are nearly getting there. And I will update all of my equipment <laughs> later on uh, next year. Uh, yeah, but it's just the last live this year. So uh, I see some concern in the chat. There will be definitely more lives next year. Um, so I also see some familiar faces or some, some familiar names in the chat. So hi, thanks so much for joining. Uh, and also thanks so much to Bob from Fundamentally Explained, who is once again very kindly uh, moderating the chat. Um, so I really appreciate it because that gives me a bit more of a chance to chat with you and not have to be reading through all of the um, comments all the time. Even though I do try and read all of the comments, I go back and read the chat later um, to see what you have all been saying. But it's nice that we can sort of keep the ball rolling and don't have me staring at the screen the whole time. So as I said, this is the last live of this year of 2023. Um, we'll be doing more next year. So uh, I wanted to kind of also talk about some of the highlights of the year. I wanted to know what your highlights uh, science wise, maybe highlights personally too, feel free to put those in. But really we're talking about science here. Um, what have you thought was the best result this year? The best um, news that you heard in the scientific realm uh, that you want to share with everyone. So drop those down in the comments. I'd love to see what your thoughts are. And um, also, because it helps the stream go out to as many people as possible, if you can give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you want to chat in the stream, then you should uh, click that subscribe button. That just keeps the uh, chat nice and friendly. Uh, make sure that we've all been very nice to each other in the chat. Uh, so that's set up for that. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what your thoughts are um, about the best uh, and most exciting science news of the year. For me personally, I've got three highlights and all of these will be coming out in long form videos. I have just had no time this year um, to edit my long form. I focus on short form content a lot of the time and on lives, but my long form content will be edited uh, further. But my favorite news of the year, um, we had the launch of the Euclid Space Telescope. So that was very exciting um, because this space telescope is already sending back beautiful photographs of space. Um, but its main job is going to be surveying the sky and helping us to better understand the distribution of dark matter in our universe and also the evolution of um, the effect of dark energy on our universe and how the expansion, the accelerated expansion of the universe has been taking place. So I think that's a really exciting telescope. I'm so excited to see more um, from that and see what results it sends back to us because it's going to tell us a lot more about the history of how our universe has evolved and the structure of it. Um, we also had, this is a personal favorite of mine um, because I was partly involved uh, or was involved in the review process, um, but in the Atlas experiment, we uh, announced the uh, entanglement of top quarks. So entanglement is a, is a quantum property and it has never been observed in high energy environments like the LHC before. So this is the first time that entanglement has been observed with top quarks and it was super exciting. And it really opens up the LHC to be like a, a quantum environment, even further quantum, quantum environment that we can study this process in. So that's very exciting as well. And also 
Really interesting news this year, we had um, the antimatter measurement from Alpha G. So we learned that it's quite probable. So the first findings of this experiment is that uh, antimatter falls down. So it's attracted to normal matter in the way that um, normal matter is attracted to itself. So the effect of gravity is very similar. There needs to be even further studies uh, and more data collected, but it's a really interesting first result to understand antimatter better. So those are some of my personal highlights. There's been so many other exciting things. And of course, I'm only really talking about a small area of physics, mainly particle physics and some astrophysics. There's so many other exciting sciences, science news and events that have been going on uh, in the last year. Um, so yeah, again, I'd love to hear what your favorite, <laughs> favorite one is. I've just seen a fantastic comment <laughs> in the chat that says, here's looking at Euclid. Uh, that's brilliant. I love it. Um, okay, so I can see, uh, yeah, I can see some great comments coming in already. So thanks, Bob, for sticking those in the in the document. So um, uh, Nachtma, I don't I think I said that correctly. Sorry, uh, said my favorite was the Nobel Prize for attoseconds. That was a, a very good choice and a really interesting um, uh, scientific discovery. The uh, the development with attoseconds. So that's a great choice too. Uh, yeah, so George is saying um, the first images of Euclid uh, and also the the shipment of mirrors for the um, ELT in Chile. So that's a uh, extra large telescope, I think, if I've said that right, um, which is very exciting as well. Um, so Andrew says the new theory claims to unite Einstein's gravity with quantum mechanics was a cool read from the University College London. So I have, must admit that I need to read more about that. I, I saw the news, but I want to delve deeper into it because it sounds very exciting. Um, so, and I, I have colleagues that work at that university and they said, oh, now I know what was going on on all those blackboards. Um, so that was quite funny when I heard that. Um, And this one I hadn't actually heard of the next comment. So I don't even know if I can pronounce half these words. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> Ronald says, Uracil in the carbonaceous asteroid Ryugu. I must have missed this one entirely. I've got some homework to do. Um, so uh, Tipcentric says, my personal favorite moments from the year were the two Starship launches. Yeah, that was super exciting. And it's really great to see these reusable rockets. Um, being even more successful and, and much larger rockets too. So that's very exciting to see. Um, ah, great. Bob's put a <laughs> link in the chat to that one I couldn't even pronounce. Um, so thanks so much. So uh, yeah, tonight we're um, going to have some more Q&A. Um, so keep your comments coming in about what your favorite scientific uh, announcements, discoveries, uh, news of the year were um, throughout the chat. And then also I'm gonna be answering any physics questions you have, any questions about CERN. I also really wanna point out two things right now while I'm remembering them. If you are an undergraduate student and you are in your, if you've already completed about six semesters uh, in physics or computer science or a bunch of other like engineering uh, courses, then go and check out the CERN summer school and go and apply to that. Um, I don't want anybody to be saying like, oh, I probably won't get in because that's not fair on yourself. If you're interested, you should go and apply. So go and look up the CERN Summer Student Programme. Um, the second thing I want to say is if you um, are looking for somewhere to maybe, I know not that many people have spare cash right now, but if you're looking for something really good to support, then we have the CERN and Society Foundation. And one of the uh, projects that they support is uh, the role of non-member states in the summer student program so that we can increase the access to many, many more students who can have a fantastic summer at CERN doing some real research and attending lectures and just getting that international science experience. It's really important uh, for early career scientists and, and other fields as well. So if you're looking for somewhere that maybe you wanna help out, then the CERN and Society Foundation is also uh, a great place to do that. And then I had a second one slash third one that has completely escaped me as I got over enthusiastic. Um, so it will come back to me later. I'm sure it will. Uh, so I can see also the, the links for those are going in the chat. So that's fantastic too. So there's a really complicated question in the chat. Um, how do you measure the spin of the particles and are they entangled when you apply the Bell's 
theorem. So the way that we measure the spin of particles uh, in top physics is we, we look at the products that the, the top quark changes into and we, we look at how they're distributed within the Atlas experiment. So to take a step back, um, we have protons in the Large Hadron Collider, accelerate them to very high energies. We collide them in the center of the Atlas detector and we don't get to choose what happens in that collision. Um, so we're picking the particles, we're getting them to as high energy as possible. And specifically about using protons, protons have, um, they're not fundamental particles, they have other particles inside of them like uh, quarks and gluons. And so different constituents, different parts of the top of the proton will collide each time and we don't get to choose that, but we're doing it billions and trillions of times uh, in our studies and then all of these different processes happen. So then we're in this kind of study, we're isolating for events where we have top quarks. Um, so we have various selections that means that we can isolate that data and then to do the measurement of the spin of the particles or even with this entanglement, we're looking at the, the way that these decay products um, come from that collision. Uh, and there's a really great article that uh, either me or Bob will stick in the chat, um, which is what we call um, a briefing from the Atlas experiment. So these are descriptions that we've written about um, analyses that are more accessible. They're for non-scientists as well as scientists to read. And this gives a really great description of how the entanglement uh, measurement works. So I will also dig that out uh, in a moment. And I'm going to tilt this down a little bit further. Get to see a little bit of my desk. I'm still learning how to get this uh, live stream to go sideways. Or maybe it doesn't want to be sideways anymore. It used to go sideways, but not anymore. Um, yeah, so thank you for that great question. I really recommend going to read the briefing. And also, actually, um, Symmetry magazine, fantastic magazine, uh, has online articles about particle physics. So if you want to read more about the different experiments. They do a lot of interviews with different scientists and they just released an article about entanglement as well. So that'll help you uh, get a better idea about it. And then hopefully I finally get to edit together that long form video uh, with some live, not live interviews, but with actual interviews with uh, some of the folks that did the day-to-day -day analysis. Um, because the way that Atlas works is that we are a collaboration of um, around 5,000 people. Uh, depending on how you count and people are working on lots of different areas of the detector um, like running the detector so operations collecting the data processing the data analyzing the data and we have a process by which you can get qualified to sign all of the papers and so everybody who's qualified signs every paper but Often for an analysis, there'll only be a, a handful of people doing the actual final steps. Um, but you have to remember that there were hundreds, if not thousands of people that touched every part before that analysis and people doing lots of different parts of the, the work. So we, we have a, a step where you get qualified and then you get to be an author on the paper. But the reason I, yeah, so I, I have some interviews with some of the folks that did some of the final steps, but these analyses are huge team efforts. Um, okay. So uh, Andres is saying, I would like to participate in a summer school at CERN. What do you do at the summer school? So that's a really great question. At the CERN summer school, it's um, between about nine to 12 weeks. Uh, some students stay longer and some uh, shorter. And you have a set series of lectures where you will hear from scientists from all around the world who are working at CERN on how the accelerator works, how detectors work, how data acquisition works, the theory behind the particle physics. So this is a set program to give a broad education about particle physics and, and other topics at CERN. And then the students will be embedded in a research group. They'll have a supervisor and they'll have a project to do throughout the summer. And it's to really get some hands on experience with research and and contributing to the work at CERN. And it's also supposed to be a really fun and um, just a big mix of people from all over the world. Uh, so an opportunity for early career scientists to really just dive into the, the world of CERN and learn about how things work there and if that's something that they want to do 
further on in their careers. So yeah, and it's in the summer, it's in Geneva, you have Lake Geneva, which is a beautiful place to sit by in the summer, and the, the city is beautiful. Uh, it's very expensive though, which is why the summer student program is paid for. So the students get a stipend to um, pay for food and accommodation while they're at CERN to make sure that it's accessible to everybody, which I think is really important and I really love that CERN does that. So you can apply, uh, if you search CERN Summer School applications, that will also come up. And then I think Bob had the link in the chat too, which I think is, uh, yeah, it's great if you, if you go on there. It's really important because you need references. Uh, so those are a really important part of the application. So ask your references early. If I remember rightly, the deadline for the Summer Student Programme application is the end of January. But really, especially with the winter break, it's important to be asking for references as early as possible and also to help your references give you the best reference. So that's that's applicable to anything you want to apply for. Always ask your references early. I was rubbish at that. I was always the one asking last minute, uh, which is not a good thing to do. <laughs> and you've got to be very nice to your referees because they take a lot of time uh, into writing those things about you. And yeah, good luck. And I really hope it works out. Yeah, and there's, I see a comment in the chat about the CERN and Society Foundation. It's also because um, a lot of the CERN studentship applications, the, the positions are funded by the member states that fund CERN. It's, it's better if we can also offer as many places to non-member states as, as well. And so that's what the CERN and Society Foundation is trying to open up, is to give more opportunities to non-member state students. Uh, and I do want to say as well, I was never a summer student. I did not know that it was funded, so I didn't apply, which was very silly of me. But I also want to say that if you don't get in, please don't be disheartened because it's such a lottery as well. So sending off multiple applications if you're still eligible the next year, not multiple in one go, that will get you disqualified. But I mean, like, if you can apply two years in a row if you're still eligible, brilliant. Um, and if it doesn't work out, do not be disheartened. There are other ways to work at CERN because that's what happened to me. I didn't even apply. And then I um, applied for a PhD program and got to work at CERN through my PhD program. So it's there, there are many other ways to get there as well. Okay. So uh, Danielle, Daniela says, what was your major? Um, so my major in um, at university was physics. I went to the University of Manchester and they did have a physics program where you could uh, you could specialize early on, but I didn't want to do this because I loved uh, all topics and found it really difficult to choose, which is also a story of my life. And I therefore went on what we called the more direct physics path. And then all of the options, well, we had optional courses in our timetable. I could then pick from all the different ones. So I put some astrophysics in, I put some nuclear physics in, I put some particle physics in, theoretical physics, uh, some history of science, which was super interesting. I did a course on how um, science fiction evolves and uh, through humanity's fears. So the things that we're afraid, afraid of and that we're thinking about feed into the science fiction that we write and that was really interesting and also yeah history of science so so more about the um the society of science uh, which was super interesting and and then also i did some really heavy theoretical physics courses that i thought i couldn't be a couldn't graduate without and uh, turns out it's not true just do whatever courses you want to do um but i mean if you love the theoretical ones you should do those too i just mean we don't have to do them because we think we should if that makes sense Mm. And I see Bob's written in the chat that he got rejected from the summer school uh, for his first year, but got in the second time he tried. So I think that's a really great example because uh, Bob is an excellent scientist and uh, he didn't get in the first time and did get in the second time. So do keep trying, even if it doesn't work out uh, and don't take it to heart because it's such a lottery uh, to get in. Uh, ah, so... This is a great question from, is it Matty? So it says, might be a silly question, no such thing. Uh, if the top quark is possible to be entangled, if it exists in a composite particle, what does it mean in regards to the other quarks? So this is a really great, great question because the top quark is not a composite particle. It doesn't form, like ev 
and every other quark buddies up um, with other quarks, either with the antimatter version of itself or or other versions of quarks. Um, and depending on how they buddy up, we give them different names. The top quark changes into bottom quarks too soon. And so, so far, we have never measured a top um, compound <laughs> particle. But if we did, that would be really interesting. And perhaps entanglement could lead us to that kind of measurement. So we don't know for sure yet. Um, it's called toponium. It's, uh, there's been lots of papers written about it and we do search for it. But so far, we have never measured the top quark buddying up. So it's, it's a really great question. It's an important part of top quark research. And so far, it's not been measured. Uh, yeah. Ah, and then uh, Andres uh, says, uh, I have to check that article. Can I get the spin on the top quark with the online data? So I so with the Atlas online data, some of it's been processed. But there is also raw data available. Um, I know, for example, CMS released um, just a batch of raw data. And so from that, you should be able to reconstruct and get the spin of the top quark. And there's a lot of papers online. They're not always, I mean, they're written for other scientists. So they're written in a language that's designed for other particle physicists to read. But there's a lot of information online about exactly the cuts that were used on the different uh, properties to be able to get the set of data that then you can measure spin. So if that's something you're interested in doing and you want to recreate that, absolutely also write about it in your summer student application, because that shows how enthusiastic you are about these kind of measurements. So um, I see that there are more people joining. So thanks so much. Nice to see you. And again, sorry, just to say, if you do give the stream a thumbs up, then it tells the powers that be that you're enjoying it. And then it gets shared out to more people, which is great. Um, so Nadia says uh, that her favorite uh, thing of the year was the aperiodic monotilting of the plane, which uh, sounds very interesting. And I also have to read up on this. I've missed so many cool things this year. Um, oh, and then uh, I, I already see this question in the chat. So uh, is it uh, Dulk, Dulkish? I'm sorry if I, I don't say usernames correctly. Um, so they say that they're going to apply for the CERN Solvay student camps. What do you think are the most important requirements to be selected? I think for that one, because this is a program designed for high school students, um, really just showing your enthusiasm and that you've been reading around or watching videos on the topic and showing that you're really keen to go to the program is the best thing that you can do. For this, I don't actually know. I haven't looked into it whether there are references, but if there are references too, then again, give your referees a lot of time to prepare. And, um, you know, you can always let them know if there are things about your background, about your CV that you'd like including. They would choose whether or not to include it. You, you don't get to choose what they put in their letters, but you can always provide them more information or point them to things that they could include if they want to. And yeah, so giving your referees, if there are referees for that one, a lot of time to prepare also really helps with the application. Um, but I will say that I know that there's only a few places for that. And again, it's a huge lottery. So please don't be disheartened, but I absolutely encourage you to apply it. I think it's fantastic. Always give yourself the chance. Um, it's statistics, right? There's a bunch of things you're interested in doing and they all have this kind of like it's uncertain chance of whether or not you'll get in apply to all of them give yourself a chance and then you have much greater statistics on uh, on getting in oh sorry i get it um nadia the the aperiodic yes i know what you're talking about now the the um non yeah the tiling of the plane sorry i'm for people watching now, you don't know why I'm mumbling because I'm reading the chat and I understand what Nadia's comment was. It took more than one tile to make tilings aperiodic. Yes, that was also really cool. It was um, about how you get repetitions of tiles with certain numbers of shapes and they were able to do an, uh, a tile that didn't repeat with the same shape. But that was really cool. Uh, I understand now, sorry. <laughs> um, there's, uh, I see a question that I get asked relatively often, so let's let's answer it here. Um, uh, Joe, yes, I'm really sorry if I say names wrong. 
why do you have the God of Destruction Shiva at CERN? So this is a statue that we have at CERN, which is the Shiva statue. It is the, the God of uh, creation and destruction uh, or creation and annihilation. It's the, um, the God is in the dance form and it was a gift from the Indian government and it re represents the cosmic dance of the universe. So it's one of many pieces of art we have around the CERN site. It's a, it was a gift, as I say, uh, from India. And it represents the cosmic dance of the universe and the particles being created and destroyed in the collisions and how this is how the universe works. So uh, in terms of this cosmic dance. So I think it's beautiful to have art around the site. And I don't understand what everyone asks about one specific piece of artwork. Um, so, yeah, we, we do have it, though. It's not not a secret. Uh Oh, and then Matty says, when does the accelerator come back online from the winter break? So I don't think, I mean, it's the, the calendar is usually pretty set. It's, I'd have to look up the exact date. It's usually around Easter that we come back on. And when it comes back on, yeah, we'll be around March. And then there has to be a commissioning phase. We always have this every single time it's been off to get things uh, in the accelerator going again. And then we'll start collecting data a number of weeks after the LHC is, is started back up again. So it will be sometime around Easter that it's on again. Uh, I can dig out the, the timetable. Uh, until then, though, if you happen to be in Geneva, I think this was one of the other things I was going to say earlier. Yeah, so the Large Hadron Collider is off right now. And um, there are very few places, but there are some places to go underground. So if you happen to be in Geneva, First of all, we have an excellent new museum at CERN. It's at the entrance. It's so beautiful. We have four main exhibit rooms. And so you can learn about how the accelerators work, how the detectors work, about the quantum realm. Um, and then we also have one that's on uh, mostly about art. I was there once before it opened. I need to go and check it out now that it's opened, but I've seen so many beautiful photos. Uh, it's free to go to, which is brilliant in Geneva. So you should definitely go and check out the museum. And then when you're there, the first thing you should do is go and talk to the visit service and say, please, can I go on a tour? Because you have to register them in person. You can't book them on an online in advance. Uh, and that's to make sure that every single tour is full up because we've got so many people that want to go on tours. We don't want to offer them online and then have people not show up. So people come in person, they get booked on a tour, and then you get to go and see something cool at CERN. And some people during until we turn the Large Hadron Collider back on again, we'll get to go underground or to see one of the detectors. Um, but we also have, you can see the control rooms at CERN where you can learn about how the, the data operation, uh, how the data is collected in the operations. We have the antimatter factory, which is a pretty cool place to go and visit. So you can see where um, the antimatter is um, collected by a different type of accelerator or it's collected in it with a target and then held with a different kind of accelerator. And then some of the experiments that we have in the antimatter factory studying its effect or the, the effect of gravity on the antimatter and doing other measurements like um, spectroscopy is a super cool thing that they're doing right now. Um, because, for example, hydrogen, the spectroscopy, so the way that the, um, the light interacts with, with hydrogen is so well known. And now we can create anti-hydrogen and hold it at CERN. And so they're looking to see how the spectros spectroscopy of anti-hydrogen is working and comparing that to hydrogen because our goal is to try and see what differences there are between matter and antimatter apart from the electrical charge. So it's a really great um, study and you can go and see that at the antimatter factory. And we also have the super cyclotron, which was the very first accelerator built at CERN. Um, and when it went offline, they uh, put concrete around it for about 10 years because then it had to cool down uh, radioactively. And now it's super safe to go and visit. And uh, we have tours that go there. And so you can see the very first accelerator and watch a beautiful light show uh, about the history of CERN and how this accelerator was used for some of uh, the early measurements of CERN, which is really cool to go and see. So if you're in Geneva, uh, I know that's not applicable to everybody, but if you happen to be passing by, definitely go and check out CERN um, because you can go and go on a tour and see the site and yeah, you can turn up and have a look.
which is very cool. Uh, how, oh, Samuel says, how kid friendly is the museum? I'm thinking of going with my toddler. Great question. Uh, I, there's not a whole lot for toddlers to do, but I'm pretty sure they can just walk around with you. Um, so, and it, it looks very shiny and there's a couple of games that can be played. So I think it should be fine, but I would double check on the website before you turn up. Uh, is the best thing to do or drop that in a comment in the video and then I will go and uh, check and ask the visit service directly and I can uh, come back and let you know properly because uh, I, I don't want you to turn up and be like Clara said I could come in <laughs> um, but also I really really want you to go visit because I think you'll have a great time uh, so yeah the visits is uh, Bob's put that in the chat so you can go and have a look on the website as well um Okay, let's go back to some questions. Uh, so Re Rianne is saying, I'm an enthusiastic senior volunteering with CERN through Zooniverse. I'm interested in learning more through online course. Do you have any recommendations? That's a really great question. Um, in terms of online courses, I mean, I'm going to be making some more videos, longer ones, but I've been saying that and trying to find the time. So I don't want to over promise again. Um, let me have a think about some good questions. I mean, Bob's got some excellent videos too about particle physics. Um, so if you want to learn about the one electron universe theory, that's a really great video to go watch. And I will dig out some more examples as well, because it's a really great question. Um, but it's one of the things I am planning to do uh, in the longer term is some more courses to explain things uh, like lectures for everybody about how the accelerator works, how the detector works, what's the particle physics theory that we're doing and the, and the measurements that we're doing. So that's for 2024 and I really should get on that. And I'm also, I do have a bunch of interviews that I filmed with some of my amazing colleagues uh, going around some of the sites. And so those will be longer videos. I just have to sit down and edit them. And honestly, I could be doing that right now, but I love talking. Uh, to people in their lives too so have to balance um so <laughs> andrea says that i miss your shirt of the lagrangian of the higgs boson i would like to get one uh yeah it's a great shirt uh unfortunately uh it's from the cern site for the cern shop and they're only currently available in person but if they ever become available online then i will definitely let you know um although hold on one second it's not a uh, CERN t-shirt, but I did get an email today and then we'll just dig this out because I want to share it with you. Uh, do, 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 do. So, if, sorry, I'm reading this and having to get the, where do I find the link? There we go. All right. So I put this in the chat so we can share it. Sorry, have to find out where to put it. I'll be back with you in one second, I promise. Um, where did the link go? Got too many websites open, sorry. We'll click the link again and find it. That's the best way. There we go. So I think this should work. All right, I'm back. I'm back, sorry. <laughs> Right, let's drop this in the chat. So if you want space stuff, it's right at the bottom of the, the doc, um, Bob, or I can drop it in. Uh, I can do it myself. Haha, I don't know if people can see this. Let's, uh, okay, I don't wanna break things, sorry. I'm getting over enthusiastic by everything. So Issa sent me a link today because they do have an online shop and they sent me a code that if you use it, you get um, a discount. I don't know how much the discount is. That's great. I should check that out properly. Um, but there is a discount. So if you want to buy anything from the ESA shop, then you can put the uh, code at the bottom. I don't get anything for this. This is not to benefit me. This is just to benefit you. Um, so ESA knew that there were people who were watching these videos who love space uh, and wanted to give you a Christmas discount. So if you put that in, uh, in the website, you will get 
a discount i will read the email properly uh, later <laughs> and uh, let you know uh, for sure what that is but again it is just for you i don't get anything from this except for the fact that i love space stuff i think ESA is amazing and um, that's the european space agency so if you want any of their cool t-shirts and mugs and jackets and stuff then you can go and put that in the website so and then if somebody does buy you don't have to do it right now maybe you can tell me how much the the code is and I'll, I'll go and check it probably myself later okay let's do some more uh questions uh so chris says and i'm, I'm just trying to make sure i understand this properly antimatter and matter suppress each other so annihilate but radiation energy is is liberate how is the energy balance with einstein's law so if if i understand the question properly which i may have misunderstood um energy cannot be created or destroyed it is oh perfect oh what's that i've been so busy okay for some reason my tv wanted to turn on okay let's turn that off so um yes energy cannot be created or destroyed it can only change into one form or another so when matter and antimatter annihilate there's no sort of violation of, of energy laws it's just that the the energy and the, the mass from those particles are changing into a different form so everything is is working out fine um, i see that adam says i got a nasa hoodie but honestly oh okay he didn't think it was the greatest quality. Um, yeah, the ESA quality, the ESA merchandise is really high quality. I can tell you that. So um, I just got a new jacket today, it, which is like a yeah a jacket, and it's super soft, and I really love it. Um, so I can really recommend that the quality of the ESA stuff is is really high. And again, the the discount code is just for you. Um, I mean, I'm going to tell more people, but what I mean is you're the ones that benefit. Yeah, uh, Zombie Kai says ghost particles messing with the remote. Yeah, I thought it might have been like a voice activated thing, but my TV doesn't have that, so I don't quite know why it turned on. Um, okay, let's do more questions. I'm clearly very enthusiastic this evening. Um, it's been a very long week and it's nearly, nearly Christmas. Oh, and they do, they do do nice mugs. I'm actually drinking out of an ESA mug right now. Um... Oh, so Andres is asking again about the, which is great, I love it, um, about the data. Is it difficult to find codes on Python or C++ to get the spin of the top quark or are they online? So you, some of the Atlas open data comes with packages where it has some Jupyter notebooks with some, some code in there that helps you talk you through the different analyses. I don't think we have anything on spin. It is a much more challenging uh, analysis. But that's great. I think you should always challenge yourself. Uh, so I, I will take a look at the open data to see what kind of packages we have because it's all been updated since the last time I used it. But I would recommend to start downloading some of those Jupyter notebooks, going through those and working with the code and understanding how it works and then moving on to the spin uh, once you understand some of the different selections. Uh... So Matty's asking, how often are anti-up quarks seen? Uh, and if seen, how are they produced? Are they possible to entangle? So the thing with anti-up is it's really difficult for us to know whether it's anti-up or up or down or anti-down. These really lighter quarks, um, they just show up as jets in our detector. They just show up as a spray of particles. And sometimes we can kind of, sometimes we could possibly infer. I don't, I don't think it's really possible at all, actually um so i don't know exactly how often they show up and they show up as jets so trying to learn trying to measure entanglement with an up or an anti-up quark would be incredibly difficult um the the top quark was the best way to do it because it has the special process of it changing into other particles before it hadronizes and before it, it produces jets so the top quark was really the best one to use for that Oh, I've just seen a great question in the in the chat from Adam, um, which says, seeing as we're near the end of the year, can I put you on the spot a bit and ask for a prediction for the most exciting result for me that we think that I think we'll see 
from my field next year? So this is also a really difficult question because I have insider knowledge. So I know what's currently being measured and I can't tell you all of that. So because we have to keep the measurements separate between different experiments. So I'm sure all of you folks are fine to tell, but if, if there are any secret CMS people watching, then I'm not allowed to say it. Um, but it is a great question. So let me explain a little bit because I always say that everything at CERN is open and that is absolutely true. You can come and visit, you can go around the site, you can talk to anybody about the stuff we're doing. Scientists are very enthusiastic to talk about their research. The only thing we can't talk about is the thing we're measuring right now, or sometimes we can talk that we're measuring it, but we can't really talk about how far along it is and what are the specifics of the analysis because we often keep for example, Atlas and CMS analyses separate in order to preserve um, the integrity of the measurement and keep the biases uh, separate, for example. So you don't want to tell a different team that you're measuring something in a certain way and that you've discovered something before you've actually finalized the analysis, because then they may think, oh, we should see it too, and that might influence their um, selection. So it's, it's about preserving um, the analysis. What can I say that's coming out? I'll have a little bit of a think and I think it's a great question and maybe if I can find some time I will even make a video and then I'll make sure <laughs> as in uh, an offline video and then I'll make sure I'm not telling you anything I shouldn't be because uh, I don't want to get in trouble um, I mean they're, everybody's very nice but we we do have to preserve the integrity of the analyses but it is a great question I loved it and I didn't answer it at all sorry <laughs> um, okay so, oh, so yeah, Adam says, if it's easier for now, maybe modify the question to be a result from outside of CERN. So then, yeah, it, mm, I was going to actually say Euclid, but Euclid is going to be measuring for, I think, about six years. So I don't know how much, we've already got the first photos from it, which were incredible, um, some really fantastic images, but I don't think we're going to get... Um, Oh, wow. So Bob says the checkout code is worth 25% off from ESA. So that's really cool. And again, I don't get anything for it. This is not, um, you know, one of those, those, those kind of codes. It is literally just for you to enjoy some space stuff from ESA, uh, which is really cool. Um, yeah, so Euclid is going to be really exciting when all of the data is starting to be analyzed because it really has to do a survey of the whole or as much of the sky as possible. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be some fantastic JWST images coming out and studies. Um, good question. I think, I mean, that that's the one I'm looking forward to most. And then I'm sure we'll get some surprises too. What do, what do other people think? What other rumors have people heard of exciting results? Maybe we've got some scientists in the chat that can share some secrets from their fields. Um, that would be cool too. Um, but yeah, so in terms of what's going on in uh, CERN, so we'll start up running again in around Easter and continue collecting data for what we call run three. So we split our runs at CERN into batches uh, where we run for a couple of years each time with our regular sort of winter stops in between. So we're currently in the third operational run of the Large Hadron Collider, and we're at 13.6 tera electron volts of center of mass collision energy. Before we started at seven in run one and then moved to eight also in run one. And then for run two, we went to 13 TeV for the center of mass collision energy. So next year we're continuing at 13.6. And so with these higher energies, really what we're getting are two things. So it does slightly change the ratio of the different types of events that are collected. So at higher energies, more massive particles are more likely to be produced, that kind of thing, um, which allows us to do, for example, if we're doing mass measurements, if we're measuring the mass of certain elementary particles, then we can compare what we get at different center of mass collisions because we can predict what we should be getting sort of the rates of uh well that's for the cross section so we can measure the the mass at different energies we can measure the likelihood of seeing these processes at different energies and that's a really important 
test of the standard model um, because, again, going even further back, the two main things we're trying to do at CERN is precision measurements of the particles that we already know about. So we want to precisely measure all of the properties for the top quark, for example. That's uh, one of the that's the particle that I'm interested in. Precisely measure the Higgs boson that was discovered in 2012. Precisely measure the other particles in the standard model as much as possible. And we're really trying to look for places where the um, predictions that we have, the standard model theoretical predictions, do not match the experimental data. Uh, and that really helps us try to look for where the standard model breaks down because it's a fantastic explanation of the universe, but it doesn't explain everything. It's not complete. It doesn't include neutrino masses. It doesn't include dark matter. It doesn't include dark energy. It doesn't include, um, it doesn't have gravity as a, as a fundamental force, for example, or a particle for the, for the gravity. And so we need to find places where the standard model doesn't explain things uh, as well anymore. And so far it's been incredibly robust. And then the other side of the work that we do at CERN is searches. So we're searching for new exotic types of particles or different ways that the particles um, that we know about change into other particles. Um, and so that then helps us find new particles or new forces in the universe. So it's really, I mean, this that's simplifying it loads and then within that there are hundreds of different teams working on different studies and we all do all these uh these studies these measurements we discuss them between each other and then we publish them so we're going to be continuing that work and some of these analyses take years to come out that's also why i have to be a little bit careful because some of the things that we're measuring might still be two three years away because we have to really precisely go through the data and understand it. We have to calibrate our detector as incredibly accurately as we possibly can um, and make sure that when we say that, for example, we're seeing a muon in this case or an electron in this case, that is actually what we're seeing because sometimes these particles can trick us in the way that the, the data um, comes out of the detector. And so that's a really important step. We are improving how often we are able to collect these particles. So uh, at the moment, we, I mean, we also never will be able to keep every single event that comes from the collisions. There's just so many happening. And to be honest, not all of them are interesting. So we design data selection algorithms in order to be able to um, choose which of the interesting ones we can possibly keep with our um with the storage and processing capabilities that we have and that even that gets even more tricky as the large hadron collider gets better as it the the packets of protons get squeezed more together which means that we get more collisions happening each time that they cross so it's incredibly uh challenging environment exciting environment and um yeah, we're also upgrading our detector. So I didn't even talk about that. So uh, one of the things that we're working on is that we're going to have a longer shutdown after run three, where we're going to replace some of the detector components that we have, for example, in the Atlas detector. I usually only talk about the Atlas detector because that's the collaboration I'm in, but the other experiments too will be having major upgrades. And so that is a, a decade long process of designing, testing, building, installing uh, these upgraded detectors. And then we plan for them to be more radiation resistant, to be faster, to be more precise and to help us with the measurements that we're doing. And so that's also a huge effort to then be ready. And then after that, we're going to have what we call the high luminosity LHC. So the high luminosity Large Hadron Collider and luminosity is like how much data. And so the high luminosity is getting even more collisions uh, every time the bunches cross and being able to collect even more data with the Large Hadron Collider, which means that any of these potentially new processes that we're looking for that are incredibly rare with more data, we'll be able to more precisely isolate those events that we're interested in, those processes that we're interested in, and maybe eventually be able to find them and confidently say that they're happening. And so with that, we're also developing even more machine learning algorithms. So something I've 
wanted to talk about for a long time is the machine learning work that we've been doing at CERN. Sometimes people call it AI, but it's not AI um, at CERN, at least not right now. Um, it's really machine learning. So we train algorithms to look for something specific in our data, and then we give it a whole bunch of data and it's able to separate things better than if we go in in person and chop it up, which is something that Bob was working on, for example. Um, and so these algorithms that we develop uh, can help us to better isolate the interesting signals. Uh, okay, so I see that there's uh, some more questions in the chat. So I'm going to move to some of those now. So Ah, so there's, there's a yeah really great question. Uh, Adam saying one qu one certain question I had uh, actually is how is the experimental runtime divided between the different detectors, uh, for example, Atlas and CMS versus Alice. So this is a really good question, and it's actually quite a sort of scientifically political one because the different groups have to discuss in committees about why they should get a certain amount of time because. Most of the year we run with proton proton collisions, but Alice or Alice, depending on how you say it, specifically want to study heavy ion collisions. So like lead or oxygen or xenon, these types of um, elements with their electrons removed are ions and they're heavy ions. And when we collide these together, we're recreating conditions similar to the early universe, which is a really interesting study. Um, it creates a, a, a way that matter interacts with itself or with each other called the quark gluon plasma and this is how we think the uh, the universe looked very early on and so Alice wants to study this and they have to bid for time with the accelerator and so people meet and they discuss the pros and cons of how long each run is going to be because it's not just the time whilst you're colliding the heavy ions the accelerator has to be prepared to be able to run in this different state, for example. And so that also takes commissioning time for the heavy ion run. And then the other teams who are pot potentially only interested in um, the proton collisions, and we do have heavy ion scientists within Atlas and CMS too, so they're thrilled when we get heavy ion runs. Uh, but the other teams who only want proton-proton collisions, they want to collect as much data as possible to really be able to isolate those rare signals they will bid for or try to, to request a certain amount of time with the Large Hadron Collider as well. And it's not just the detectors, it's also the accelerator teams themselves. They are developing uh, better ways to run the accelerator. They want to study how they could build better accelerators in the future. And so they also need time with the accelerator to do machine development work and also studies for their own research, which is very important if we want uh, great accelerators in the future too. And so that is another consideration that the teams have to talk about. And on top of that, we also have very special runs. So we have detectors either side of the main large detectors, which we call forward, because if you have the beam, they're forward of the beam either side, the forward either side, <laughs> we don't have backwards, um, they're forward detectors and they uh, study, for example, events where perhaps protons come by and they don't actually collide head on, but perhaps they exchange a particle. And then because the protons have slightly less energy, then they would get bent differently in the accelerator and they get measured by those forward detectors. Uh, and we also have uh, detectors further down the beam pipe that are looking for exotic types of particles, so uh, different types of neutrinos or dark matter particles further on down the accelerator as well. So for the forward detector runs, they would like special conditions where the beam is operated in a different way. And also, for example, if we want to study precision W mass measurements, which you may have heard um, relatively recently about the result from CDF, which was an experiment on the Tevatron at Fermilab. They measured the W mass to be ever so slightly different to what the sort of world average that other detectors measure. And uh, if that's true, that's really exciting, but we have to confirm it. And so 
to really precisely be able to me measure the W mass, you want a very clean environment, which protons are not clean because they've got stuff inside of them and then they spray particles everywhere. And so sometimes we do a run where instead of having uh, 60 collisions happening every time the protons cross, we have one or we try to get on average one, which is then very low statistics, but very clean data and much more precise when you rather than having 60 events with 60 sprays of stuff coming off everywhere and you have to measure it in your detector and you have to reconstruct it and work out what came where and there's always some uncertainties you just if you have one collision even though it's still proton proton it's got fewer stuff coming out of it which you can then say okay it just came from that one collision much cleaner, much more precise W mass measurement. So all of these different teams and all of these different people are wanting to run the accelerator in different ways to be able to, to get their data. And so they have to write documents and present about it and convince the committees that that's what we're going to do with the Large Hadron Collider because it is, CERN has many member states from different countries and different teams. Our teams are all very international. It's not like you have a French team or a German team. People like work in very mixed teams, but you know, everybody has the different priorities. And so everybody will present and request different data time. So, uh, oh, great. And Bob's put a, a, a link in the chat that says, this is seriously what a lot of collisions at the same time can look like. So I'm going to click on that afterwards because I'm sure it's just going to be like, uh, so it kind of looks like a firework. So, uh, yeah, thanks for the great question. I really, uh, there was loads to talk about there. Um, so Karen has asked, does CERN work on the measurement problem? And I, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if it's just because I'm late, but I don't, I don't understand the question. Um, sorry. Uh, George asks, what is the heaviest ion used in ALICE? And I am going to guess lead, I think but I might be wrong. So if I am wrong, feel free to correct me in the chat because uh, I, I think, I don't know what the mass of xenon is. Uh, this is what scientists do. We look stuff up. Uh, yeah, no, I'm pretty sure lead is the heaviest one. Yeah. Uh, but feel free if I am actually still wrong to tell me I'm wrong. Um... Okay, so also Matty said, do you have any favorite sci-fi movies or series from 2023? Any 2024 upcoming that look exciting? Uh, I have no idea what's coming up in 2024. I tell you who does know, um, pop culture scientist, who is also on YouTube, she was on the live that I had last time, uh, is the best person to ask about what's coming up in sci-fi. So she really uh, stays on top of all of this and does an excellent podcast and makes lots of videos about sci-fi in science. So I definitely recommend going and checking out her channel. And if you didn't watch the previous live, please feel free to go and watch that because we had an excellent chat about sci-fi um, in the last stream. I really enjoyed it uh, and it went on for two hours. Sorry. So <laughs> please go watch it. Uh, but it was a really fun chat. And maybe if I have some time, I might edit it down. But uh, again, that requires that requires some time. And I do plan to take a proper holiday over Christmas. So I am I love talking about particle physics and I really enjoy my job, but I also need some downtime. So there's going to be slightly less content over the winter break uh, after Christmas. And then I'll come back again. Uh, late, mid, no, late early January. Is that a thing? Like about a week after New Year. Um, so yeah, I see Bob's putting the the links in the chat. Thanks again. Uh, oh, okay. But my favorite sci-fi was also the question. Favorite sci-fi movies. Um, oh, I watched, is it called, hold on. It's not really a sci-fi movie, uh, but it kind of is. I watched Palm Springs movie, which had a surprising sci-fi twist in it, which I thought was brilliant um, at the end. So it, it gets a bit, a bit quantum-y at the end, if I can say that without spoiling it, but it's a really fun movie. Um, I've wanted to watch it for a while and uh, finally got around to it recently. And I, I love time travel loop movies. The, the, yeah, just the concept of them, they're, they're fun. So 
that was a really fun, slightly sci-fi movie. Um, there's a whole bunch I still need to catch up on. I think a lot of this winter I'm going to be catching up on. I need to catch up on The Expanse. I'm so far behind on that because I can't even remember which platform it's streaming on, but I lost access to that platform early on, did not manage to keep up with it, and then I now think I can watch it again. So probably going to be binge watching that because uh, people say that it's fantastic. If you want to tell me what your favourite sci-fi movie and uh, TV show recommendations are, I would love to hear them. Um, please feel free to put those down in the chat or in the comments afterwards, and uh, then I'll have lots to, to watch. Also, actually... I'm going to take this opportunity. I wanted to get some sci-fi books for Christmas. What sci-fi books do you recommend? Uh, because I said I want to switch off and I was going to not do any work, but sci-fi is not work, it's fun. Um, so if you have any recommendations for sci-fi books that aren't like this big because it's only two weeks for Christmas, then please do also let me know what I should be reading because I want to go and have some sun, some fun sci-fi uh, break. Um, okay. I think those, that's most of the questions I can see. Oh, Arrival. Yeah. Uh, JR's, uh, JR's Journeys says Arrival with Amy Adams. That is a great one. And I actually need to rewatch it because, uh, the the I again I don't want to spoil it in case anyone hasn't seen it but you should definitely go watch it the way that it, the movie is threaded I think is the best best way to say it is fantastic it's it's a really great movie um yeah I'm trying to think what my other other recommendations would be again I I need to catch up so please let me know your recommendations um and I will go and do my homework. And also, I'm sure I can ask Abby for her recommendations as well. Okay. Um, what was the newer Alien movie with Gillian Anderson? Did I miss one? Uh, Tip Centric says, there's a really old sci-fi book that may be hard to get, but it's totally worth it. It's called This Perfect Day by Ira Levin. Ah, I should definitely. Okay, I'm adding that one to the list. That sounds like a good recommendation. Oh, and A Long Way to a Small Iron Planet by uh, Becky Chambers uh, is is inc incredible. And I need to read the sequel. So I read the first one. And you're, yeah, great recommendation. I should, should catch up on that. Um, Eric is saying, can you talk about M theory and what is being done at CERN about it? Um, so honestly, I'm not not quite sure um because that's more for the the theoretical scientists in terms of experimental studies on it uh, there's not really that much we can measure with it uh let me see if So there is a, if you go on a link, there is a, a something from the theory department that says uh, recent developments in M theory. So there are, so that was a, a meeting about it, but that was two years ago. So honestly, I'm not up to date because I'm very much on the experimental side. Um, but, uh, and at the moment, there's not so much to test, uh, which is uh, a shame, but I'm sure there's a lot of the, the, the theorists are doing and that I should update myself about it on. Uh, so Ravdos says, uh, Tenet is a great film that most overlooked and I haven't heard of it. And also uh, El, El uh, Abassi is saying Monarch. So I need to go and uh, look those out. So yeah, there's already some great recommendations and some also great reminders of things that I told myself I was gonna watch or read and uh should go and do those uh, tenant is awesome so there's another recommendation for it there from uh, tip centric okay so i would love to stay and talk to you all about sci-fi um but i should probably head off for the evening so i want to say thank you so much for joining thanks so much for all of the support this year and for joining the lives asking questions and all of your enthusiasm uh, for the, the work that we're doing at CERN and the research. 
and I will definitely be back. Don't worry, this isn't the last one ever. I will be back uh, next year with even more lives and more long form video and more short form content. So there'll be a lot more happening. I've got, so as I said, I've already got some uh, long form videos uh, filmed that I just have to put together. So with a bit more quiet time, I'll be able to get those done. And I already have one potential. I'm not going to spoil what it is. I just want to be one of those. I, yeah, I might be getting to go somewhere cool in the UK um, to make a video and show you somewhere that does some really great particle physics research in the UK. So stay tuned for all of those. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, share more with you next year. And I hope that everybody has a great northern hemisphere winter break uh, and uh, happy holidays if you celebrate any of them and yeah have a great rest spend time with loved ones and see you again uh, in the new year so thank you so much and uh, take care and thanks yeah thanks again to bob uh, for moderating the chat uh, i always really appreciate that he spends his time helping make sure these live streams are um, so fun and interactive and collecting all your questions. So thanks again to Bob. Thanks again to you and uh, see you again next year. And I can't find the button. I think it was this.